Well, good evening, everybody. On behalf of the New York Encounter, I'd like to welcome you to our session on ideals versus ideologies and politics, a lost battle. Um, I am Brandon Vaidinathan. That's a weird name, but I'm a weird guy. Um, I'll moderate this event. I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce our two guests who will join us for our conversation this evening. Uh, their full bios you can take a look at on the Encounter website. Uh, to my left, Sora Bamari is the op-ed editor of the New York Post and a contributing editor of the Catholic Herald. Previously, he served as a columnist and editor with the Wall Street Journal opinion pages in New York and London and a senior writer at Commentary Magazine. The memoir of his Catholic conversion, From Fire by Water, was published in January 2019 by Ignatius. He'll be signing copies after the event. He's working on a new book for Penguin Random House, exploring 12 questions our culture doesn't ask. Christine Emba is an op-ed columnist and editor at the Washington Post, where she focuses on ideas and society. She is currently writing the book, Rethinking Sex, on the failures and potential of sexual ethics in the post-Me Too world. Before coming to the Post in 2015, Christine was the Hilton Kramer Fellow in Criticism at New Criterion and a deputy editor at the Economist Intelligence Unit, focusing on technology and innovation. Christine holds an AB in Public and International Affairs from Princeton University. Please join me in giving our guests a warm welcome. <laughs> So our event this evening is about how politics, instead of reflecting shared ideals, has become prey to ideologies that divide and polarize us. Ideals emerge from the relationship between reality and our deepest desires as human beings for truth, goodness, freedom, justice, cheesecake. Um, <laughs> their, their pursuit requires a willingness to learn from our experience, to be corrected by reality. Ideologies, by contrast, are systems of ideas that provide a sense of coherence and identity. They're even a means to power. But they're also distorting filters that inhibit our openness to reality, making it de facto irrelevant. As George Packer said, ideology knows the answer before the question has been asked. So at least that's how we're using these terms this evening. I want to start by asking you, Christine, uh, what ideals and what ideologies do you see as most potent and influential in America today? Well, <laughs> a very simple and easy question, which I will, I will get to. Um, there are, I would say that the ideal that I think is most potent is one that I think you guys actually talked about just before this, an ideal of the self, um, of the individual, uh, who is responsible for themselves and no one else, who is self-actualized, uh, who moves through the world freely and unencumbered. And that is an ideal, that is something that many people aspire to, but I'm not sure it's an ideal like cheesecake, say, uh, that is an unalloyed positive. Um, <laughs> cheesecake is not, just to be clear, we're all in on cheesecake. Um, <laughs> And then an ideology, and this is one I've written about, um, this one that's come up a lot in this election specifically, capitalism. Uh, when you think of a, a sort of totalizing way of understanding, you know, a framework through which you can put everything in which always knows the answer, the way that America especially lives right now, the by far most domineering ideology is capitalism. When we think of the world, uh, when we think of how we live, how we can become better people, how we achieve our desires, we think about the market, and it's become a, a totalizing obsession. So I'm writing this book about sexual ethics, um, and as a result, I'm spending even more time than usual uh, talking to my female friends, uh, and some of my female not friends, um, about their thoughts, their feelings, their hopes and dreams about relationships. And I'll give you one example. Uh, a friend of mine who is a little bit older than I am is not dating somebody, but she really wants to have children, but is also weighing the costs. 
And she calls this, jokingly, but also kind of despairingly, dating under late capitalism. <laughs> and conversations with her, and many other women, in fact, often involve a sort of a discussion of market value. You know, if I see this person, am I blocking myself from seeing this other person? Like, is this worth my time? How much do I need to save up to have a child? In one case, somebody told me that they think to have a child, they just need to have $200,000 a year. And that is the justification that they are making for freezing their eggs and also taking certain jobs and dating or not dating certain people. The answer is always money. The way to look at even the sort of nearest desires to our hearts is always through the lens of the market. How can I optimize my Tinder swiping so that I can meet the person quick enough, but not too quickly to keep me from fulfilling my own human capital uh, and engaging in my job and in my own market in the best way? And it's totalizing, and I think mm. it's terrible. Oh, thank you. So, Rob, how about you? What, uh, what do you see? <clears throat> First of all, thanks for having me. Um, ideology is a fraught topic for me. Um, I'll tell you a story. When I um, was 27, I started working at the Wall Street Journal Opinion Pages um, as an intern. I was part of a cohort of interns, and I was doing pretty well. Like, I was, you know, hustling really hard, like placing like an op-ed a week. And, and I had another friend who was in this cohort who was also an intern, but you know, he was, he was a philosophy PhD student, and he was, he was Catholic at the time I wasn't. And we were at a gathering of a sort of, of young first things kids, and, I, and we were both there. And he was kind of complaining, look, I can't believe, how can, you, how can you have an opinion a week or a day? And I, like I said, I was 26, 27, I was like, it's easy for me, I'm an ideologue. Um, uh, so, uh, look, I, 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 and not to answer the question seriously, I think um, I would, Ditto what Christine said about the ideology of the self-creating self. Um, I don't think it's an ideal. I think insofar as it um, uh, doesn't match reality of who we are as human beings, of our nature, of our longing for community, um, for deep attachments, in that sense, it's a mirage and an ideology, so not so much an ideal. Um, and from it flows the way we think about economics, that markets exist for their own sake and for uh, fulfilling um, our longing for capital, for accumulation, and nothing else. Uh, and I would say that there's a subsidiary ideology that goes with that, which is the kind of scientistic, technocratic, economistic ideology. That is the idea that, that all questions the only questions worth asking are ones with answers that you can measure or articulate either in, in mathematical formulas or, or uh, in market value or in something feasible. Is this, is this thing feasible or not? And that in itself is its truth value. Um, so I think those are some of our reigning ideologies. I would just add, I think a, th a third one that, that scares me is, uh, and I would say in some ways it's a reaction to the ideology of the unbound self and of this kind of deracinated individual uh, subject. Uh, but it's also a thing that exists in itself and shouldn't just be treated as a reaction. And that's the idolatry of race or nation. Right? I think that's, that's coming back and it's very old and very pagan, but it's, uh, it, it's also be being rekindled today. So I think those are, and I think all the three that I mentioned kind of have a, have a perverse interplay. Can you say a little bit more of the idolatry of race relation in what, in what sense? Well, it, 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 it kind of, uh, well, I don't think uh, every kind of nationalist movement uh, is worrisome. And I think some of the new nationalists are, are on to something about liberal ideology and its shortcomings. But when it's a kind of pinched nationalism, um, it's a kind of omniscience in which your, your, your identity answers all questions and you make all deductions from that, then it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about a few specific ideals. Uh, so the French revolutionaries famously invoked liberty, equality, and fraternity. And at least liberty and equality hold a prominent place in American political discourse today. Uh, perhaps the one we hear most often on the left is equality. 
But what does equality mean today? Uh, why is it so prominent in our political imagination? And can our increasingly secular society even sustain a belief in equality? Um, so, sir, uh, can we start with you? What do you, what do you think of that? Well, I think look, in, equality is a modern ideal. It's a worthy ideal. Um, I find more meaning and more ability to think through um, social problems in the ideal of justice. Because obviously there are inequalities built into the human condition, none of which can be ultimately completely overcome through policy or this and that. But uh, justice is the idea of giving each his due, including God in society. I think it's a worthwhile enterprise, but either one, whether you t go with a sort of more modern concept of equality or justice, to me it seems very hard to sustain without a belief in the human person as having a special origin and a special destiny. In other words, um, why should I see the dignity in an other who's, who's radically different from me um, if that person is nothing more than just a collection of you know, cells and, and tissue and synapses firing and there's nothing special about his origin? So in that sense, religion is the backbone of of justice and of all of our notions of human dignity in a way that would be as, as recognizable to St. Augustine meditating on, uh, on Genesis and Confessions all the way up to you know, someone like uh, Martin Luther King or Howard Thurman talking about uh, 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 Jesus and the disinherited. Um, so I think not only religious concepts but rituals, if I may digress just a little bit, ritual is also necessary for most of our ideas about human dignity and community and justice. I mean, um, this is, I'm, I'm working on a book and one of the questions mentioned is, is why or how does God want you to play? And by play, I don't mean games, but play as being the closest secular analog we have to ritualistic or, or liturgical behavior. And, um, I, you know, you look at, you know, a, not just communities like you know, Catholics or, or uh, Christian liturgy or Jews with the Sabbath, but even tribes, for example, in, in Africa, right? The, uh, the Vic Victor and Edith Turner uh, are, are a pair of anthropologists who, they were Marxists, went to, um, went to uh, then um, British Rhodesia, and encountered and lived among the Ndembu tribe. What did they notice about their, the ritual that the tribe had for selecting a new chieftain? Right, the new chief, chieftain is called the Kanon Shega. The, the character or the mythic figure who in ritual gives the chieftain his new status Right? Every ritual involves you kind of separating yourself from the community and then being brought back in somehow and your status is upgraded or your, your tensions with the community are healed. This, the, the figure who gives him this is called the Kathwana. And he's, he, he, she actually is a feminine figure who represents the people who, who toil the earth, who don't have political power. And in the process of the ritual, the chieftain-to-be has to be subjected to a kind of ritual humiliation by all the villagers. They can say whatever to him, they can insult him, he looked at me weird, blah, blah, blah. And he's supposed to take it all, and after he assumes his status as chief, he's not supposed to hold it against the people who insulted him. So these kinds of, it's a religious ritual in which the strong, in order to attain his status as the strong, has to show solicitude for the weak. These are all, obviously there are uh, much clearer analogs in, in this kind of thing in Christian liturgy or in, 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 in all the sort of vital great religions, but I don't know where we find them in a modernity that's not uh, a ritual way of living. Uh, that ought to be the way we uh, promote people to CEO. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> ritual humiliation. Ritual uh, humiliation, I like that, yeah. Uh, uh, Christine, how about you? What, 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 do you make, what sense do you make of equality in this, in this context we're in today? Sure. Um, differently, I think. I, I'm still in favor of the idea, obviously, um, but also the use of the word. My definition of equality is pretty simple. Um, I think it means that people 
all people are equally deserving of worth and respect based on their you know, intrinsic human dignity. And so they should be treated equally, um, not treated as you know, more or less valuable, uh, worthwhile or less worthwhile based on their race, their sex, or any other characteristic. And I do, I think, agree with Sorab that that's a little bit harder, that idea of equality, which I think we actually still mostly pay lip service to, although even that lip service is slipping in certain movements. I think that that ideal is harder to maintain in a secular society when there isn't a clear place to, there's not a clear backstop. There's not a clear place to appeal to um, for that definition of human dignity. I think as Catholics, as Christians, uh, people who believe in a God who created us all and loves us all, there's an easy explanation for why every person is a valuable person. You know, hello, like that's what we were made to be. Um, but when there's not, you know, a consensus on that kind of simple but very important claim, um, then it's harder to make the point to people who disagree with you, who are um, racist or sexist, that actually, no, you should, you should be kind and respect everyone. Um, so while equality, I think, is a simple concept and still exists, it is somewhat in danger as our shared understanding of who gives that equality is receding. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Um, the other thing I seem to notice is many people today animated by the ideal of equality are drawn in a new way to socialism. Uh, why do you think that is the case and what consequences do you think that might have for us? So in anticipation of this question, I was looking through some things that I wrote and I wrote a piece called Our Socialist Youth in, I realized today, 2016, uh, which makes me feel very old, because I'm not <laughs> sure I can call myself one of our socialist youth anymore. <laughs> um, but the genesis for that piece, and an explanation that I think still holds true, even more true today, is that Socialism is not necessarily as in, say, our parents' age and those who lived through the Cold War, um, associated with, you know, Stalin, with the USSR, with communist countries and food shortages. Socialism has sort of taken on the meaning of, like, Scandinavian, but in the coolest sense. <laughs> like, it's about equality for people in that it's about a government that treats its citizens well, and also treats most of them kind of the same. But again, well in that it thinks that every citizen, not just the ones who can pay for it, um, are deserving of healthcare, or education, <laughs> or houses to live in. And so it tries to provide that to people equally. And I think that's come to the fore now in the past uh, several years, because millennials, and I still claim that I'm one of those, um, really came of age, you know, during or after the Great Recession. And they have seen that the opposite of socialism, the previously still currently reigning ideology, um, a capitalist sort of free market ideal, did not lift all boats equally. <laughs> In fact, it seems to have sunk many of them and lifted some completely out of the ocean. Uh, and they want, they want to be equal. I think our technology, our ability to use social media, our increased connection uh, through the internet has also made it really easy to see inequality. You can see yourself, but now you can also see exactly what everyone else is doing, including those who are far better off than you for reasons that are not clear or even are clear and are terrible. Perhaps they're exploiters in some way, perhaps they have abused the law and yet you're completely unequal. And that feels unfair, and it feels unjust to many people. And if socialism, then, is a more equal way of life, that equality is very attractive. Okay. So what do you think of this? Yeah, I think the attraction isn't a mystery. Uh, I think there's too much, too much insecurity built into American life. It's too, it's too hyper-competitive. I mean, I, I feel it. Um, <laughs> Uh, 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 I feel it in, in, 
you know, let alone people who are struggling in the economy, although things are on the whole, I think, you know, we're seeing remarkable growth and so forth, still um, set those people aside. Even among people in my milieu, they feel this kind of constant pressure. Um, I think the health insecurity, um, the sense that any time you could lose your job and then if you got sick, um, uh, uh, what would you do, is, is going to get people thinking about socialism. And so um, what I always say to people on my side of the debate on the right is if you, if you don't want socialism, you have to try to address these um, in a more meaningful way than people on, on the right have for a long time. I also think uh, to, to Christine's point about people not making sacrifices or not committing to anything, and that's certainly true Again, in my milieu, I see it where people, you know, uh, are dating for, they're going into their ninth year. Says, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> what, at what point, what's, what mystery left to be, is, is left to be, you know, you're living together. But I think part of it, this is not the whole thing, but part of it is the fact that in order to make great sacrifices, you, ha you have to feel a kind of security. Mm. And a, a society in which, uh, disruption is an ideal and an end in itself, uh, people will feel insecure and they won't make uh, the kinds of sacrifices. What I worry about the new socialism is precisely what Christine said, is that um, what's imagined is kind of uh, a society in which still the ideal is the pursuit of the self-creating unbound self and just happens to have a kind of bigger, more bloated welfare state attached to it. Um, and so that's a question that I think people on the left have to answer of, okay, what is the, act, what is, what is the end of human life? What, is, what are the goods that, uh, uh, that should be pursued at the level of the political community? Thank you. Let's stick to the second ideal, liberty, right? Or as uh, my French friends say, liberté, which is my favorite brand of yogurt, um, <laughs> is one of the founding principles of our nation but it has also taken on a heavy ideological flavor, right? Many understand liberty as this absolute autonomy of atomized, socially disembedded individuals. And Christine, you've written about how this ideology of maximizing individual autonomy, especially as embodied in the sexual revolution, led to the various problems that gave us the Me Too movement. And Saurabh, you've written about how the same ideology promotes the worship of free speech and free markets without limits. Uh, could you say more about what's, what's wrong with, with, this, with this notion of liberty that we entertain, the way we think about liberty, and what a healthier ideal of freedom could look like? Uh, Saurabh, let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, in many cases, and I think uh, Pat Deneed, who spoke just before, in the uh, session before, has diagnosed this precisely, which is in many dimensions of life, the ideal of freedom without limits, without either natural or traditional limits, has ended up perversely promoting tyranny, right? So um, you can look at various dimensions of life and see this working itself out. At the, in the university, um, toppling the old kind of autocratic master didn't lead to a kind of birth of of free thought, it's brought forth this giant bloat of administra administrators who regulate student life to sort of a minute detail, and students themselves who are deeply, have d uh, deeply authoritarian instincts. Um, in, uh, in the level of, uh, let's say, the workplace and the sexual revolution, you see how um, uh, corporations are happy now to say, we need to support a right to abortion because it's good for business. In, in, in Ireland, the story came out uh, not too long ago where airlines had been putting pressure on female pilots to either uh, uh, abort or keep their jobs. So again, the ideal of freedom becomes the most kind of totalitarian, uh, it, it, the ideal of unbound freedom becomes a source of, source of unfreedom. Uh, losing the Sabbath as a social practice and an ideal has not made us it has not made us free. I mean, unless you think of, of these long brunches as a, <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a source of profound encounter. But for, I mean, I, 
I, I joke, but for lots of working class people, the loss of Sabbath has just meant that they don't have time to see their, see, to, go, to, to go to the baseball game, to have a minute. Um, the loss of barriers between work and leisure means that lots of people in my class can't sleep. They're, they spend hours just by this sort of ghostly blue glow, haunted, you know, just surfing and the infinite scroll or, or responding to emails. So, it, um, it, no, do we feel free? Is that freedom? Christine, what, what, do, you, what do you think? What, uh, what is freedom and what is a healthier ideal of freedom? I think that I perhaps tend to think about these questions on a much more uh, personal and individual level. In fact, sometimes I worry that actually, you know, expanding definitions of freedom to describe, you know, schools as authoritarian or not authoritarian is a little bit of an ideological statement. Um, I'm an ideologist. <laughs> Um, but I, in my writing about sexual ethics, as you mentioned, um, I've come to identify something that actually has been identified by perhaps smarter people uh, before me. In fact, I think Isaiah Berlin made the speech uh, exploring this concept in 1958, um, this difference between positive and negative freedoms. Um, and so there's the freedom that is kind of an avoidance right? Like you're free from external strictures. Like no one will tell you what to do. You can leave work whenever you want. You can sleep with anyone you want. You know, no one has control over you. And that freedom is really celebrated today. Um, and we see it evolve and reemerge in different forms. Um, I also think of the slogan of the 68 revolution in France and Paris. And the only thing the main statement was that it was forbidden to forbid. That was the only thing that is not allowed, to constrain yourself. But there's also another kind of freedom, you know, a positive freedom, and that's a sort of self-mastery. Uh, the freedom to not be pulled hither and yon uh, by things that you, within yourself, can't control. Not to be controlled by your lust, to be controlled by your desires, to be controlled like I am sometimes by your inability to log off the internet, to just get off Twitter. Christine, just get off Twitter. <laughs> um, you know, a freedom, a personal freedom, a freedom that lodges itself within you and that allows you to interact with the world in the healthiest ways. And I think the problem that we're seeing today um, is that America has really embraced, really the West, the modern world has really, really embraced the former kind of freedom. Uh, we want to be free from any stricture, uh, free from ties to our families and parents. They can't tell us what to do. Um, free from recommendations from a church or community. Like, I don't want to go anywhere on Sunday. And so, Rob, actually, as you point out, then this is very easily overtaken by, you know, tyrannies that play on our lack of the other freedom, self-mastery, to convince us to do things that we actually probably don't want to do. But I think that what's at issue is that we spend far too much time cultivating that negative freedom, pushing away all ties and strictures, and not enough freeing ourselves, understanding who we are as people and what the good would actually look like for us. Yes, what we were made to do, what our society is supposed to look like, how we can aim towards that. And so we are left unmoored, completely free, but also tied down and kind of empty. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, what about the third ideal that nobody seems to speak about anymore, which is fraternity, right? Except for perhaps the Pope. Um, why, why is that? Why, why, why aren't we talking about fraternity? Does it even matter? Uh, what is the scope for genuine fraternity in today's world? What, what do you think? So I actually think the answer to that one is pretty clear. Um, fraternity talks about other people. Fraternity implies, in fact, demands responsibility to someone else. Um, you are responsible for your brother. That's fraternity. Like, what they need has an impact on your life, and you are obliged to take care of them. And to many people, responsibility feels like the opposite of freedom. Mm. And as we continue to reify freedom, 
being responsible for your brother, responsible for your neighbor, responsible for the person who goes to your church is less and less attractive. And it's something that maybe we'll give lip service to. Um, you know, we'll toss something into the collection box. We will like donate through our screens to some far off charity. But when it actually comes down to speaking with the person in front of you, um, even just taking off your headphones on the subway to acknowledge the humanity of the person sitting next to you, uh, that seems a little bit too hard sometimes. And a real embrace of fraternity could be both grand, um, just in American politics, an obvious example for me is thinking, thinking about the lives of others. When we talk about, say, immigration, not just thinking about it abstractly as, oh, this will make my life difficult in some way or not difficult in some way, but who are the people who want to come here? What would drive someone, say, to cross a border? What would that look like in my family? How do I feel towards them and how can I, say, help this person? Even though the outcome, the decision you might come to on immigration is, could be anything, but actually living with that person to, yes, like the very, very basic ones. I should call my brother more often. Yeah, me too. I should uh, call him later tonight. Thanks. Uh, Sora, fraternity, what, what, is, what does that mean to you? I have two thoughts. One is, uh, just to paraphrase uh, Monsignor uh, Knox, just to the uh, idea that, um, that fraternity is only possible if you have a shared paternity. So this goes back to the early idea of religion and specifically biblical religion as being crucial, I think, to the ideal of, of human dignity and equality and justice. In other words, if, uh, if I can see you as having origins in the same place as I do in the image of God, um, then I can fraternize with you and to see you as my, as my brother or sister. And that's, that's obviously with secularization has been eroded. I also think um, to some extent the uh, head spinningly kind of uh, rapid pace of, of life, but especially of uh, uh, the ideal of the citizen in, in a liberal society as being uh, not really belonging to a community, whether that's a local community or a nation, but just being free to go anywhere, party anywhere, um, leaves people uh, unable to, especially those elites, unable to socialize and see as brothers people who, who don't have that way of life because they're, uh, they're not part of the class of people who can, you know, for example, live in London, work in the city, and then just uh, jump on the Eurostar and spend the weekend in Paris and come back and so forth. Um, increasingly, uh, the people who aren't mobile, in hypermobile in that way, and the people who are mobile see themselves at a, uh, in, a, in a mode of confrontation. Um, and I would say, finally, that this in this idealized subject of liberal order, who isn't bound to community, um, raises, there are questions about his or her political attachment to, to any community, right? In other words, um, the citizenship, which is bound up with fraternity, requires you to feel some degree of loyalty to some community, and I think, as a, as a political realist, I have to say that humanity at large um, is too large. I mean, you can uh, you, you could say, you know, I, I see someone as, as made in the image of God, but in, in so far as we have mutual commitments and so forth, that requires some degree of, of being bound within some border of, of, of shared experience and, and community. Um, for all these reasons, I think fraternity has become a an elusive ideal. Mm, thank you. Um, sort of, uh, you've had a remarkable journey from Marxism to conservatism, but can you talk about one ideological aspect that you don't like in today's conservative movement, and perhaps one ideal, if any, that you respect 
in today's left? One I don't like. I, have, I don't like uh, <laughs> I've, I've spent the pick past a, year arguing with the right, <laughs> more right. or less. Um, I would say I, I'll just name things that, that get on my nerves. Uh, <laughs> One of, them, <laughs> one of them is that uh, because the right, has, at least sections of the right, has become obsessed with dethroning political correctness, so many on the right are like, now I'm going to be, let me be offensive, as, you know, as though that's its own end. Um, uh, and you can see, you, know, you, can, you can blame censorious liberals all you want, but... Uh, to say that they propose a kind of uh, a procedural way to, uh, a narrowly procedural way to get along in the world, and it's suffocating, sure. In answer to it, I'm just going to be a bore. Um, <laughs> and I think a lot of people, uh, people thought that, uh, uh, you know, I had the debate with, with uh, David French that I said, you know, do away with civility, it meant that, well, I never said to do away with civility, civility first of all, but I meant that, that my point was we should just be ugly in the public square. And I'm saying that we should propose a counter ideal, which a lot of conservatives don't do. All they uh, often stand for is the right to be obnoxious. And that's not, <laughs> that's not any kind of ideal. So, um, and I would say on, really on, on the economic front, uh, the sort of the lack of empathy in certain corners of the of the libertarian right, I would say, where um, uh, it doesn't answer life's questions and problems for lots of people to say, you know, if you don't like such and such, move. If you're if you're if you're poor, work harder. You know that that kind of attitude. But I, I will say that that's that's shifting on the right, and to the extent that one can be grateful to the new right, if you will, it's by discarding some of these shibboleths. What about an ideal uh, on the left that you, that you find admirable? Mm. Well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, look, I would, I, I would talk about it all evening. I, I, think, I think the right needs to talk about economic justice. The right needs to talk about uh, equality. Um, the right needs to talk about health care. Uh, and, you know, we, we may disagree on the precise solutions, but to say, as many maintain, as much of the kind of right-wing sort of think tank intellectual apparatus does, that it's not a problem, uh, first of all, doesn't win you elections, and second of all, is, is unjust in itself. Yeah. Thank you. So in that sense, now, again, we, we'll, we'll sit down and begin to talk about what the common good is and how to achieve it, but a, a right that says there's no such thing as the common good uh, is very troubling mm -hmm. and useless. Right. Christine, what about, I mean, wherever you put yourself on the, the left-right spectrum, um, tell us about an ideolo ide ideological aspect that you don't like in today's left and an ideal, perhaps, that you, that you respect in today's right. Yeah, it's funny from like, hearing about myself from the outside, it seems like I'm all over the map. Like, maybe on both ends of the spectrum, sort of in the middle, it's unclear. Um, I think by now, most, most observers, and maybe myself, have converged upon saying that I'm towards the left, although perhaps more socially conservative um, than some expect. There, that has been the response when people come to some of my writing on sexual ethics, a sort of surprise and confusion. Um, <laughs> But I appreciate the earnestness of the left. I do think, though, one thing that I would criticize is uh, scale. I think the left today, or discourse on the left, um, sometimes gets you know, caught up in the bathwater and sort of misses the baby completely, um, or heightens some conflicts and does not deem to notice the real ones going on. Uh, in the real world. So I'm thinking of exchanges that I've had uh, or seen, again, often on social media, which is the worst place to take away any impression of any part of the political spectrum. Um, but, you know, people saying things like, ah, like not being 
not being asked to answer X question in class is violence. Like this guy leaving my messages unread is violence. This is a mental health issue for me. I'm like, is it though? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's, I mean, it's when somebody doesn't use the, the sort of uh, cultural, you know, depictor that you prefer when they say Latino or Latina instead of Latinx. Um, that can be annoying, uh, but also there are like real people in Latin America who have real problems. Um, and maybe we should spend more time talking about the actual issues. Um, and that's something that I think, maybe this is also a problem of being young or you know, of being unused to political discourse. I think the past four years have just brought many people, many more people on the left into the discourse and the work of politics or thinking about policy than before. Um, but you know, keeping your eye on the real, the real issues and not making everything about your personal problems or assuming that your personal problems are everyone's problems. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's something that the left can struggle with a bit. Is there anything on the right that you see that, that maybe the new right is doing right? Or any ideal that you, that you find uh, worthwhile? Yes, well, again, the, the past four years have really scrambled some political categories. Um, so, I wouldn't say that this is the case with many conservative politicians. Um, and I say, I use the air quotes because I'm not sure that there are many of those left. Um, but the thing that I have always loved about conservatism uh, and have learned from it is that, you know what it says in the name, that there are things worth conserving, that we can look to tradition, uh, that we can look to the past and try and gain some understanding of what things have persisted through time and things that are valuable, whether it's an ideal of beauty or truth or goodness, uh, love for place and family, that it's not worth throwing all of those out, that there's still something valuable there and should you know, come with us into modern life. And I think that's incredibly important um, to note that all progress forward doesn't necessarily mean forgetting everything that is behind. Oh, thank you. We, we are in an election year. Are you seeing any examples of crossing the divide in our, in our current campaign? <laughs> either, either on the left or on the right. Uh, do any of our presidential candidates demonstrate a willingness to be corrected by reality instead of manipulating it? Is anybody <laughs> championing ideals more than ideologies? I realize I shouldn't have phrased this as a yes-no question. <laughs> Um, yeah, what a time to be alive. <laughs> it's, uh, it's great. Um, actually, actually, do former presidential candidates count? <laughs> so sure. I, and I think a lot of people experience this, the impeachment proceedings were um, both long and short and confusing. Um, and at the end, we kind of knew how things would turn out. Um, but what I think shocked a lot of people in politics, and maybe also a lot of people who had tuned out for most of the proceedings, was the fact that former presidential candidate Mitt Romney um, gave an impassioned speech um, voting yes on an article of impeachment uh, against the president, Donald Trump. And he said that he did this because his faith demanded it. Uh, the role that he was elected to play in the Senate demanded it, that he look at the truth, respect the truth, and vote the truth. Um, and in doing so, he went completely against his entire party, um, the ideology, the ideal of which, unfortunately, now seems to be presidential boosterism and not much else. Um, and I think that that was, that felt to many and to me like a sort of shot of light through the clouds in some way, seeing someone actually take a stand for what they thought was actually correct instead of going along to get along. Um, 
a current, actually a current presidential candidate um, who I have found myself interested in is Elizabeth Warren. And I think she's a good example of somebody who has allowed reality to perhaps check her ideology or ideals. So she, her history is that she started out as a very pro-free market um, Republican when she was a professor at Harvard. And then her research took her to bankruptcy uh, and financial issues. And she spent a large amount of time researching how bankruptcy works in the United States, um, talking to people who have lost their houses, their livelihoods because of bankruptcy. Um, and then she wrote this book, The Two Income Trap, um, and actually kind of significantly revised her economic ideology to take into account um, the fact that families were struggling, um, that in fact the free market markets will solve it if you're going bankrupt, you're not working hard enough and it's your fault ideal that she had come to believe in was in fact not really the case for many of these families who were working as hard as they could, who were doing all that they could and who could not compete against you know, big banks um, and Wall Street financiers uh, who were running what did seem to be a corrupt system designed to take from them. And so she went actually from being a Republican um, to being a Democrat and working to fight corruption and finance at this point. And I think that being willing to go as far as you know, changing your party and your sort of entire ideological, um, uh, the way that you're facing, I guess, um, your entire ideological turn is, is huge and it was corrigible because she went and lived in the world and spoke to people around her, an example of fraternity, you might say. So I find that admirable. Mm, thank you. So Rob, how about yourself? What are you saying? For my, uh, for my sins and for professional reasons, I had to pay attention to the impeachment hearings. I hope <laughs> most of you didn't have to do that. Um, I, so I, I will just leave it at that as far as Mr. Romney's intervention goes. But um, I, I, look, I honestly think, especially if you've been on the right and you have felt the weight of the dogmas emanating from the libertarian industrial complex, you will be or should be very pleased with how President Trump has challenged so many of those. Just think of the issue of China. I, I remember because I was immersed in it, um, where it was just taken for granted that we have to move toward ever deeper trade integration with communist China. And uh, it, it, there was there was no one challenging that ideology until I think a kind of Queen's Vulgarian came around and said, wait, we're having the Chinese build our 5G infrastructure, this regime that keeps a million people in a, uh, a Mus million Muslims in a concentration camp. Uh, you, you know, we're having the Chinese, uh, uh, we're thinking about having them build national security sensitive infrastructure. All that was was perfectly normal to the sort of expert ideology of the right. Well, well, the, the more we spend time and if we have complaints, we can take it to the WTO, blah, blah, blah. No, it wasn't working. And so I think we have to give credit where it's due, that that's a radical departure from where the right was on these issues. Um, I would also say, I mean, he doesn't get enough credit for it, though she sure brags about it a lot, is the criminal justice reform, the First Step Act, um, was an example of, I think, the Trump administration um, crossing the divide, and I, look, I've had such bad experiences prognosticating election outcomes, so I really shouldn't do this, but I think that that will pay dividends in terms of uh, in November, but we'll see. Okay, all right. Um, thank you. You know, you're both journalists, and in your profession, uh, I'd like to know how difficult you found it uh, to avoid falling into the trap of ideology. I mean, the theme of the New York Encounter this year talks about the possibility of something unexpected, an event, that can break through the shell of ideology, that can allow your humanity to emerge. So are there such moments in your own experience as political journalists that you can share? Yeah, I 
just am a boundless source of magnanimity on Twitter. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I kid. No, I, I, it is a trap to fall into ideology and to see the other person as just an avatar that you argue with, and it's very ugly. But yeah, I, I will mention an experience. I think it was your former colleague, Liz Brunig, um, not too long ago, posted a hospital bill for her child being born, and it was something like, $160,000 of which she was responsible, you know, she was responsible, she and her, her husband, for like $8,000. Um, and I had a similar experience. Uh, I felt like I crossed the divide with Liz in the sense that a while ago my son caught something called a human metanumavirus. It's not a big deal. I mean, it can be a big deal because it affects their breathing, but it just requires some monitoring. So they, they you know, we had him at a hospital. It was fine. They monitored him, sent him home. It was fine the 24, 48 hours. And then this bill came. It's $23,000 for one night, of which we're responsible for three, $4,000. Now, for me, okay, I'll give an extra speech somewhere, I'll write an essay, whatever, we, we can handle it. But it made me think, how do, how do middle-class Americans deal with that? You know, what, if, you're, if you're living paycheck to pay, paycheck, you know, even if you have, a, you have decent insurance, which is often a questionable matter, how do, you, how do you begin to deal with like an, a, just a $4,000 bill, or, or in Liz's case, $8,000 cash bill just being dropped on your finances? Um, and, I, and, and so, look, Liz and I uh, have our disagreements, but at that moment, you know, I felt her Twitter rage in a, in a healthy way. Right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That's good. Christine, how about you? I wish that more of my experiences of humanity breaking through were as salutary, literally and figuratively, as that one. Um, for me, I think that the experiences that have been most transformative are, in some ways, not even necessarily reaching across the divide, although doing so is important, but the ones in which the humanity of other people or even oneself uh, is forced through. So as political journalists, you know, we spend a lot of time uh, thinking about polls or prognosticating about our ideas or punditing, as I called it uh, in our break room, toiling in the content minds uh, to come up with more ideas and more takes on different subjects. And it's really easy when doing that to um, lose perspective or some, on, on some level uh, to begin, yes, to think in terms of arguments you make, uh, lines of thought that you are pursuing, um, policy ideas that you think are good, and not even necessarily thinking of the person uh, who they would impact, how they might impact you or others, like what, what this is doing in the real world. Um, and one of, actually a, a painful moment of kind of bridging the gap from reality to ideas, or rather thinking about things as idea propositions to like the really cold and hard reality on the ground, um, came for me in 2017. Um, when white supremacists were marching in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, and so I spend a, a lot of time writing about ideas in society, that's my beat. And so it had sort of been like thinking about like, oh, like what does the rise of nationalism mean? Like, hmm, like polling on racism is changing. Like, what does that say? Like, what do all these things mean? How do we address this? Um, you know, from like my office in Washington, D.C. Um, but then that weekend happened, and it was an odd confluence of events because I grew up in Richmond, Virginia. My little sister is actually still in college and was in Charlottesville the night before um, for a college visit. And she thankfully left, you know, that day, and I was in D.C. still, and my parents were in Richmond. But it was a profoundly shocking day, um, a profoundly shocking experience in the sense of actual feeling that real hatred, that real danger was this close to me, this close to my family, 
that it was real. It was not a question of polling and people on the internet and like what ideologies are swirling in the ether, but like. For the benefit of, of folks who may be, you know, from out of the country, could you say maybe in a minute what happened in Charlottesville? Sure, sure. Um, so Charlottesville, there's been a long running controversy about Confederate statues um, in various places. Uh, in Charlottesville, Virginia, which is the home of the University of Virginia, there is a statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Um, and there had been a debate about whether to take down this statue, um, seeing as it you know, celebrated a Confederate soldier. Um, and in response to a decision to take down or move the statue rather, uh, there was a march in Charlottesville uh, by a group that describe itself as Unite the Right, which ended up being a motley collection of white supremacists, uh, KKK members, uh, people who believed in free speech, uh, people who called themselves conservatives, um, but generally people who were uh, racist and angry. And on the day of the march, the march happened, there were many conflicts, somebody was killed, um, many assaults happened, it was a frightening day. Uh, and unexpected, um, and I was covering that. Um, but there's that, sorry, yeah. yeah, go ahead. How did that affect you? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a there's just a difference between you know arguing with somebody on the internet about hey, you shouldn't say racist things, um, or okay, but like political correctness, like maybe we're too politically correct, or not politically correct enough, or you know you're impinging on my freedom because. I'm not allowed to say the N-word in a joke. Um, discussing that is one thing, but knowing that your actual humanity is threatened in person and realizing that that's really what the discussion is about um, is an entirely different matter. And that is something that I think has, when it broke through to me, made just even the writing process much more fraught, um, but also much more important because you realize, you know, this was just me. And I'm, I think, a, a relatively privileged person. I was not there, I was not harmed. My family, luckily, was not harmed. Um, but these discussions aren't just about what is nationalism or what is free speech, um, but they're about real people's lives, um, real people's pain, the understanding that we're deciding to treat some people as human and say that some people don't belong here. Some people don't belong in our country and deserve to be harmed. And that's major. Mm. Thank you. So in the minute or so that we have left, I'd like to ask you uh, to, to perhaps say in a, in a sentence or so, um, what do you think is the most important an urgent ideal that should guide American politics for the good of the American people? Catholicism. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, I would say reason, but reason properly understood in the sense that uh, not just narrowly scientific, economistic, technical reason, but reason in its full sense, that, that questions about the, the, the good of human beings and their final goods, or their ultimate good, are within the scope of human reason, um, and that human reason can be aided by the church. Mm, wonderful. Thank you. Christine, how about yourself? It's a hard follow-up. <laughs> um, I think for me, the, the word, <laughs> if there is one, would be humanity. Um, and I think that my ideal, um, the best way to guide thinking about how America should function is first thinking of people as humans. You know, these are, this is not some ideology that we need to impose on America top down, or the country needs to change in X way. There are humans, individual human people who are hurting in some ways, who need certain things, who want to live their lives, who are brothers and sisters to you and I. 
How do we think about them? How do we center the human person in making decisions? Thank you. That's great. Fantastic. I don't know about you all, but I think we're kind of on the right track here, hey? This weekend has been, uh, I think, a great embodiment of, of these ideals in many ways. Um